Is it a PC? Is it a mini computer? No, it's a workstation. What's the difference? Well, unlike those first two, this machine can't do any work by itself. It has to be part of a network. This is the original Sun workstation from 1982, quite a landmark in the history of the Internet. The young people who designed it coined the term, the network is the computer. So with this workstation, I can access information on other computers on the network. I can store my information on other computers on the network, and I can harness the power of every computer on the network. Those folks at Sun, they're very bright. The Sun workstation has become an $8 billion business. When the PC was little more than a high-powered typewriter, workstations had the processing power to meet the needs of Wall Street, NASA, and even Hollywood. Guess where it started? This is Margaret Jacks Hall at Stanford University, one of the most historic buildings of the digital age. Three companies got their start here. Cisco Systems in the basement, Silicon Graphics on the second floor, and Sun Microsystems on the fourth. Collectively, they must have a market value of, oh, $100 billion. And Stanford University never made a penny from any of them. What are they doing to this place? Uh, the first Sun workstation was built in an office on this floor by a young German graduate student named Andy Bechtelsheim, who just couldn't wait to get out of the fatherland. I was actually quite frustrated with the, the German university program at the time because I, I, I truly felt I was wasting my time. You know? So the, the first thing I went when I went to a German university in, in the middle, middle 70s was I applied to come here. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it was very boring. A clever geek like Andy is essential to any digital startup, but in order to succeed, you also need someone with a driving ambition to get things done. For Sun, that spark came from a Stanford graduate from India, Vinod Koshla. Ever since I was 16, going to high school in India, I dreamed of coming to Silicon Valley to start a company. I was a technology geek. Um, and it was a very much a dream of mine to start a company. In fact, in 76, when I graduated from engineering school in India, I tried to start a technology company in India, which was a hopeless task. The Sun workstation was designed from the start to be part of a network. The whole concept of the network is the computer. We started uh, the Sun 15 years ago based on the fact that every computer should be hooked to every other computing device. Uh, on the planet, and uh, that's been our strategy and our goal from uh, day one. Computers become much more useful once they're connected because it's the, the sum of the computers on the network that allow you to, to do more than you could do in any individual computer. Because Andy had used off-the-shelf software and hardware for his workstation, Sun made a virtue of necessity and based all their products on these open standards. It made them different from companies like Microsoft and Apple, and they've been the champions of open standards ever since. We added openness. In other words, nobody should own the written and spoken language of computing in the same way that nobody owns English, French, or German. Now, Microsoft might disagree and think that maybe they ought to own the written and spoken language of computing and charge us all a $250 right to use license to speak English or Windows or whatever they happen to own. Sun's timing was perfect. They caught the wave of networked computers and offered a low-cost solution for another need. This was the 80s, and Wall Street was crunching numbers faster than ever for junk bond issues, arbitrage deals, and other kinds of financial smoke and mirrors. Sun workstations filled the trading rooms of banks, brokerages, and minimum security prisons. The thing about Wall Street is it's extremely competitive. In other words, if somebody can, can compute something or figure something out faster than the guy next door, it doesn't matter what the equipment costs, that's what they want. So each trader wanted to have the, the fastest, highest powered workstation right on the table so to do better trading. And uh, Sun eventually became you know, the dominant standard on Wall Street for trading workstations, uh, not just on Wall Street, actually worldwide. The networking breakthrough occurred at a most unlikely place, a computer systems company in deep financial trouble. Here's just the faintest reminder that this was the first home of Novell Data Systems, now Novell. It was a startup that failed. Lots of startups fail. Some fail and die. Others fail and are refocused and reborn. That's what happened with Novell. The company was really in trouble. They were shopping around for new venture capitalists. They'd run out of money. And 
actually at the 11th hour, uh, the week before Ray Norda came on, they were at, we actually had a little uh, auction at the company. We were selling desks and chairs and equipment so we could make the payroll the next week. Oh, wow. And uh, Ray Norda literally came at the 11th hour and uh, uh, rescued us. It wasn't the U.S. Cavalry, but the next best thing. Ray Norda was a veteran turnaround wizard, venture capitalist, and Mormon. Some say he was sorry for the people at Novell. He was called in to save the company. The treasure Ray Norda found in the ruins of Novell was a software project called Netware started only a month before. Netware allowed users to store their data files on big PCs called servers, to share their data with other users, and to use any printer on the network. PCs just couldn't do this stuff before. And the guy who thought it all up, Drew Major, wasn't even a Novell employee. But that Ray, he knew a winner when he saw one. Mountain biking in the Wasatch Range. I quickly discovered that my brain functions better at sea level. But despite the thin air, Novell prospered. Ray came in, Vestris brought him in and said, can you fix this? Can you, can you turn some money? And he said, you know, the future is software. It's software that connects these computers together and got us out of hardware and later got us completely out of hardware, which was, at one time, hardware was 60% of Novell's business, so to, to get out of that was a big move, but it paid off in spades. I think in the high-tech area, you, you know, you could, you could say it was technology, we were fast. You could say it was people, Drew is really smart, uh, he was a brilliant man. Uh, Ray was strategic in what he did, but it has a lot to do with timing. The, the advent of the PC, the market need, Novell filled it. In December, we went and saw an IBM PC, the first one in Utah. IBM did a lot of stuff right, and so we thought, well, hey, we could network, network that. And so uh, we bought the first IBM PC in Utah. We were the first guys to network the IBM PC. I had figured out the most cost-effective way to link a bunch of personal computers together. They had taken a, a very small part of the problem. They decided we're going to let you, you know, share files off disks. Uh, we're going to let you detach all these computers together in the network and we're going to let you share files and we're going to let you share printers and maybe send email back and forth and that's pretty much it and uh, virtually everyone wanted to do that with their PC network and they came to utterly dominate the, P you know, the PC network world and that red box at their height was as common as any logo I can think of. It was the equal, certainly the equal of Microsoft uh, in those days. If you needed a PC network, if you, you know, and the IBM PC and the Intel-based PCs were just growing by leaps and bounds, and we connected them together better than anybody. So ours was the LAN operating system of choice. I know what you're wondering. Here we are halfway through the story. We've had everything from prize pigs to Mormons, and still no sign of Microsoft. How can that be? What's Bill Gates doing? Well, time for a flashback. Cue dissolve and archive footage. The 80s were good to Microsoft. Thanks to their partnership with IBM, the money rolled in and the company got bigger and bigger. But it was a love-hate relationship. They loved the royalties from selling all that software for IBM PCs and clones. But Bill Gates hated having to fit Microsoft's plans into IBM's business strategy. One thing that's hard to remember now is that all of us uh, were in fear of IBM because IBM wasn't just thought of as a hardware company they were thought of as the everything company. Supplying most of the operating systems in the world's personal computers might be enough for some people but Bill's always hungry for the next opportunity. In the computer market when the first person comes along and does something very well if they get over a certain threshold then uh, it really develops momentum because the distribution channel doesn't want to learn a lot of products. They don't want to trust a lot of products. And once you get a customer base, they start talking to you about, why don't you fix this? Why don't you improve that? And we've seen many, many products like that in the history of personal computing. Some Microsoft products, some non-Microsoft products. Netware is a great example of that. Well, Gates was very focused on Novell. And in fact, in 1989 um, was the first time he contacted us, late 1989, to see if he wanted to uh, it, see if Novell was interested in being bought. Really? So that started two episodes of Microsoft trying to buy Novell. 